All right, well, why don't we get started? I want to make sure we have a lot of time for questions and um, opportunities uh, for all of our panelists um, to participate. So um, I want to welcome everybody to the start of Education Day. Um, and I will just start off for, for me, one of the joys about being in academics is seeing your former trainees flourish and really come into their own. And I've known Dr. Uh, Sharu actually since you were a resident um, and, and then chief resident, and you probably don't know this, I was part of the, uh, the fellowship selection committee when you applied for a pulmonary fellowship. And, um, you know, it was, I remember the discussion because it's all about talking about your passion for education and um, how you saw yourself developing a career. Um, and um, it's been a joy watching uh, you continue to develop and really excel in this domain. So, um, you know, this is a very special uh, presentation for me. I also um, wanted to give a big shout out to Dr. Laura Zakowski, who is our Vice Chair of Education and Professor in, in General Internal Medicine, as well as all of the members of the Education Committee who've done a tremendous job of pivoting to virtual activities uh, during these challenging times and have organized a, a true tour de force program for today. It's my first education day, so I'm very excited to participate. Um, I hope all of you will come along for the ride as well. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Zakowski. Thank you, Dr. Schnapp. Welcome, this is our sixth annual Department of Medicine Education Day, and we have a record number of registrants this year. And I have to say, it's okay that we don't have to brave the weather here today to gather at the MFCB as we've done in the past. We have an exciting day starting with grand rounds, then presentations from our Education Innovation Grant awardees, and then we will be awarding our inaugural Education Mentoring and Inspirational Educator Awards. Following that will be our breakout sessions that will finish the day. And you can join the rest of the day by finding the email with the Zoom links from Abby Rudzianis. She sent that yesterday at about 1.45 p.m., just in case you didn't have the chance to register. And I will introduce Dr. Goldberger. He invited our speaker on behalf of the Education Committee, so thank you for that. And then Dr. Goldberger will introduce our speaker. So Dr. Goldberger received his medical degree from Yale School of Medicine. He completed internship and residency at University of Washington, and then a cardiology fellowship at University of Michigan. He did a health services research fellowship as a RWJ Foundation clinical scholar. He spent six years on faculty at University of Washington, and then he joined our UW cardiology uh, division as an associate professor of medicine in 2018. We're so lucky. He's a member of our Department of Medicine Education Committee, and he serves as an associate program director for the Clinical Cardiac Electrophysiology Fellowship. Thank you, Dr. Goldberger. Thank you, Dr. Zakaki. So my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Bashak Chiru. Dr. Chiru is an associate professor of pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine and the program director of the Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine Fellowship Program at the University of Washington. She got her medical degree from the Medical College of Virginia and completed residency, chief residency, and fellowship at the University of Washington. She serves on the education committees of the American Thoracic Society and the Association of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine Program Directors, and is highly active in undergraduate, graduate, and continuing medical education both locally and nationally. Her interests in medical education include curriculum development, coaching, and leadership. Her CV is a master class as far as career development in education and education mentoring. She has won countless teaching awards. She won the Association of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine Program Directors Darlene Buchak Award for Educational Excellence. She was a two-time recipient of the American Thoracic Society Innovation and Fellowship Education Award. And she recently won the David J. Pearson Award for Excellence in Education and Mentoring, awarded by the Graduating Pulmonary and Critical Care Fellowship class. I've known Fushak for many years. I met her in 2007 when I was her senior resident when she was an intern rotating on the internal medicine service at the University of Washington. And as such, I'm gonna say that I am directly responsible for all of her accolades and excellence, but that's not the case. Um, what was clear from the day I met her was that she had innate gifts in education, leadership, 
scholarship and clinical excellence and professionalism. I can't say much shock that I've learned more from an intern since, and it's been rewarding to follow your career over time. Her talk this morning is entitled Medical Education, Thriving During a Pandemic. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Prashak Charu to the UW-Madison Med Medicine Grand Rounds and the Department of Education Education Day. Prashak, stage is yours. Um, Dr. Goldberger, thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction. I'm thrilled to finally be visiting the other UW, um, and I'm especially honored to be here to kick off your Education Day. So I thought to mark the occasion, we would take this opportunity to take stock of the last year and to really celebrate all the ways that medical education has flourished. So I will tell you that I have no financial ties to disclose. I have listed an attribution here for where I've gotten some of the images for this talk. And these are my learning objectives, which are gonna serve as our roadmap for the next 50 minutes or so. I wanna spend a little bit of time reflecting on some of the challenges that we have all faced in the last year. And then we're gonna spend the bulk of our time discussing some innovations in medical education. And then we're gonna end by looking a bit towards the future. And I will tell you that my goal is to have you um, leaving here inspired to learn more uh, and to connect with your peers on education day. So obviously one of the biggest challenges we've collectively faced this year is a global viral pandemic. This photo was taken by one of our critical care nurses in our COVID ICU in early April. And I think photos like this have become emblematic for the last year uh, and coronavirus. And while these photos capture a lot, I think, of the last year, what they um, really fail to capture, I think, is the fear and the chaos, especially in those first few weeks that we all experienced. Um, we, at the time, didn't know how this virus even spread. We didn't have any effective therapies. And there was a lot of concern for both personal safety as well as the safety of our trainees in the, in the workplace. Um, I suspect this was similar in Madison. Early on, we had policies and procedures changing, it felt like every few hours. So it was just a time of chaos. And it's just persisted. And we've certainly seen these surges and things get better and then things get worse again. And I recognize that there are folks in the audience who perhaps haven't cared for patients with COVID-19 directly, but I know that this virus has affected everyone. There are folks who had to adapt to new workflows like telemedicine. Some of you have faced increasing clinical demands and trying to balance that with homeschooling children. And I suspect there are also folks in the audience who have actually lost loved ones to this disease. So it has impacted us all. This was not though the only tragedy of the last year. We saw the murders of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd. We saw our communities rise up in Black Lives Matter protests. I have a photo here at the bottom from a neighborhood in Seattle. And I think we started to have conversations about racism as a public health crisis and thinking more um, what our role is in that as clinicians and also as educators. And all of this was going on against the backdrop of the most contentious political election I remember in my lifetime, all of which culminated in an attack on the US Capitol last month. And some of you may say, well, this doesn't have anything to do directly with medicine or with medical education, but I think these were all really big events and they impacted us personally and they certainly impacted our learners. And I think part of our jobs as educators is to make space to have conversations about events like this. I realize that there are other challenges that you all have faced. So I'm gonna ask that we take some time to actually reflect on the losses and the challenges of this past year. So I wanna just take 10 seconds of silence for you to think about what's been hard and challenging for you in this past year. Despite 
this most challenging year, I think we have had so many successes and I'm going to share a lot of national examples of successes. But before I do that, I want to hear what local wins you have had at the University of Wisconsin. So I'm going to ask you to put in the chat box some meta successes um, that you've been a part of there. It could be at the clerkship level, at the School of Medicine, your division, department. Give me a sense of what you've seen in Madison. I saw reference to fellowship recruitment and the switch to virtual interviews. I think that's been a big change. We're going to talk about that. Perseverance, adaptability, absolutely. Yep, students coming off of clinical services. I saw reference to teamwork. Someone mentioned a hybrid curriculum in the internal medicine residency, right? We have to suddenly create new content. Okay, these are great examples. So I wanna talk through um, some examples, like I said, from across the country in terms of innovations in medical education. And I've grouped these into four big themes. We're gonna talk about the creation of new content. Some of you have alluded to that already. Some new roles, new formats, and then new ways of disseminating education. So there's actually been a lot of new content that was created in the last year. On March 17th, the Association for American Medical Colleges came out with a recommendation that students refrain from direct patient contact. And this happened for two reasons. They wanted health systems to have time to develop and implement their response to COVID-19. And they also wanted to conserve personal protective equipment or PPE. And as a reminder, 10 or 11 months ago, we were seeing photographs of healthcare workers wearing trash bags at work. So with all of these medical students grounded, schools had to really think about what do we do with all of these students? Some of you have alluded to this in the chat. The Ohio University Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine partnered with the Ohio Department of Health to create a four week public health course for about 250 third year students. They worked with the National Guard in Ohio to virtually deploy these students to local health departments all throughout the state. And they provided some education about COVID-19, what we knew so far about PPE, testing, possible therapeutic strategies. And then they also had students help out with the public health effort. They answered hotlines, they served as contact tracers, they helped patients navigate the system. And I think this was brilliant. Um, public health has generally been undervalued in undergraduate medical education um, and clearly is important as we found out in the last year. So I thought this was a great approach to having students off of clinical rotations. Now, Vanderbilt did something similar. They created a pandemic medicine course, and it was also focused on public health, but had uh, a few additional goals. So they wanted students to understand pandemics going all the way from epidemiology to therapeutics, but they also wanted students to explore leadership approaches in times of crisis. And then finally, they had a focus on um, decision making. They wanted students to be able to appraise the literature, but perhaps even more importantly, they wanted to explore decision making in the absence of data. And I think we tend to make things very black and white for medical students in general, when in reality, there's so much gray in medicine. And clearly with something like COVID-19, we've seen that as well. So I thought this was a great addition uh, to a brand new curriculum. Uh, in terms of the flow of this course, they have students go into one of seven tracks. They included things like health inequities or global health or ethics. And then regardless of track, they followed the same basic approach. They spent the first week learning some foundational material. In weeks two and three, they had case-based studies focused on the 1918 influenza pandemic and the original SARS pandemic as case studies. And then they ended by having the students come together for simulation and to have them teach each other what they had learned in their individual tracks. Now, at the University of Washington, we thought a lot about what do we do with all of these students who were signed up to take sub-internships? 
These are required for graduation, but more importantly, this is how students really feel like they prepare for their intern year, where they learn those practical skills they're going to need the first day of internship. So educators here partnered with four fourth year medical students who had already completed their internal medicine sub internship in the first half of the academic year. And they created a course that had four domains. They had a number of sessions that included case based interactive teaching drawn from the curriculum for clerkship directors in internal medicine. They also had a number of skill building sessions focused on things like writing orders or delivering serious news. They had lots of opportunities for case discussion in virtual morning reports. And finally, they focused on professional development, having our chair of medicine talk to them about leadership approaches, having the students complete an individualized learning plan and having them teach one another. For these near peer teachers, there was also a focus on medical education. They got to learn about course design and small group facilitation, and they co-taught many of these case-based sessions. I've shown you just some outcomes um, from this virtual sub internship. The students were surveyed before and after the course, and I've shown the mean Likert scale score on the y axis, going from one being strongly disagree and five being strongly agree. Um, and in all of these domains, the students reported they felt more confident at the end of this virtual clerkship. Now, they also got some free text responses and performed a qualitative analysis, and they found three domains and some themes underneath each of these. The students were initially incredibly skeptical. They were disappointed to miss out on this experience. They were nervous about starting intern year. But they said the course ended up exceeding their expectations and they specifically called out the supportive learning environment and the opportunity to practice clinical reasoning. And finally, they said, we feel more prepared for intern year. And one of the quotes from uh, a medical student was, I may not know all the answers, but I know I can use the knowledge that I have and the resources that are available to me to find those answers. And I think um, that's what we would want for any one of our incoming interns. And that was undergraduate medical education. We also ch saw changes in graduate medical education. We saw residents and fellows that were redeployed to different rotations. Um, many of our GME trainees, I think, felt very socially isolated. They were had maybe just moved to a new city um, and physical distancing was in effect. So a group of program directors in geriatrics came together to create this virtual network, national network um, of fellows. They recruited 55 participants from 14 programs around the country. And they set up weekly hour long sessions that were focused on things like COVID in long term care facilities or advanced care planning in the time of COVID. And perhaps more important than that content, they created community. They introduced these fellows to their peers across the country. They got the opportunity to network and to collaborate. And I think this was ingenious. This is something we haven't traditionally done with our GME trainees. Now, the other big change that we saw in terms of content was telemedicine. I certainly uh, never learned this skill anytime in my training. So a group, um, Dr. Benzinger, who is a cardiologist in Minnesota and her colleagues put together a guide on how you can examine a patient through a computer. And it was focused on the cardiovascular exam, um, but you'll see it's pretty comprehensive. So we saw great educational content like this being shared as well. And then finally, we saw um, some recommendations about how we might teach about telemedicine moving forward. So this group wrote a perspective in academic medicine suggesting that all programs should really be teaching about this. And they suggested that educators consider five domains, access, cost, cost effectiveness, and both patient and clinical experience. And then they also gave some recommendations on how programs might do this. You can use small group discussion. You can use standardized patients and have faculty observing learners um, to give them feedback about these sessions. So a ton of new content that was created. And I think importantly, a lot of this content was new. We talked about public health and telemedicine as two of those examples. But we also saw a lot of new roles. Now I told you what we did at the University of Washington with our grounded medical students. Other programs, especially programs that were in hard hit areas in the country had a different approach. They gave their students the option to graduate early. And NYU was the first program to do this, but over a dozen medical schools around the country adopted this approach. 
So students went from being a medical student who was virtually graduating on a Zoom screen one day to the next day donning a white coat and going to work on the front lines. Um, so very big change in role overnight. At the University of Michigan, they quickly realized during their first surge that they were gonna run out of respiratory therapists who were available to care for the number of hospitalized patients that they had. So a number of educators that there came together and they created a three-part curriculum to teach medical students how to be respiratory therapist extenders. They taught some basic anatomy and physiology and the basics of both invasive and non-invasive ventilation. And then they also did some in-person teaching sessions on things like how do you administer neuter dose inhalers? How do you restock the RT cart and document an assessment? And their model was to have one respiratory therapist with three or four medical students reporting back to that person. So they truly extended the reach of the respiratory care specialists. And then the other big change we saw in terms of roles and workforce were our ICUs becoming overwhelmed with the numbers of patients and not having enough intensivists. So I, a lot of people in the chat mentioned things like teamwork. We saw people from all kinds of specialties step up and say, we're gonna come and help in the ICU. We have surgeons working there. We have dermatologists working there. And educators at the University of Pittsburgh realized we need to teach folks how to be comfortable with mechanical ventilators. People may have not seen these in a very long time. So I'm gonna show you a clip of one of their videos, just a brief segment. Pressure of 36 centimeters of water. The peak pressure represents the maximal airway pressure in the ventilator circuit during inspiration. The patient is also breathing at a rate of 22, which demonstrates that he is not breathing above the set rate. Finally, we can also see a minute ventilation of 9.1 liters per minute and an inspired tidal volume of 424 milliliters. If your patient had been on volume control ventilation rather than pressure control ventilation, as in this case, you would have set the tidal volume directly. Let's imagine that you have a patient who was intubated because of ARDS. He is on the ventilator and the FiO2 is set at 70% and the PEEP is set at five centimeters of water, as in this example. He is currently saturating 85%. What is your next best option? Okay, so that was just a brief excerpt. There, I've listed one reference here. There's actually five of these uh, videos that were created. They're all about six to eight minutes in length. They're interactive and they're just a fantastic resource that are um, available. These can be used by trainees, but they can also be used by folks who are working in the ICU uh, and not familiar with ventilators. These settings result. Now, educators at the University of Washington also wanted to create some materials for folks who might be working in ICUs. And rather than focusing on videos, this, these groups created these one-page summaries of common problems that come up in the ICU, acute respiratory distress syndrome, renal failure, atrial fibrillation with RBR. And they provide a great general framework for both evaluation and management. And then I think importantly, they also call out places where you need to stop and pause and call for help. And they bold these out and say, this is where you wanna reach out to an intensivist or to a consultant to get more help. And I just wanna highlight that Josh Lee and Trevor Steinbach were senior pulmonary and critical care fellows who were extremely busy clinically, and they really led this effort. They partnered with faculty in our division to create these resources. So, Lots of different new roles, um, but I think probably what we're all most familiar with, and some of you alluded to this with the change to virtual formats, is also a lot of new formats. Now, much of teaching in both undergraduate and graduate medical education looks like this. This is from our Foundations of Clinical Medicine course in our medical school. Lots of small group teaching. And we quickly saw that we went from this scenario to this one where all of our teaching was online. And I will tell you that I was personally devastated when this happened. And the reason is that I had spent the last five to 10 years taking all of my prior PowerPoint talks and converting them into chalk talks. And so I thought, oh my gosh, I, I don't know how to teach online. I'm gonna have to create all kinds of new content. So I'm gonna take you through um, my approach. This is how I started. So first I created PowerPoint slides where 
I put content on a slide and then covered it up with white boxes and I would ask questions to the students, have them interact with me a little bit, and then I could click on these boxes and reveal some of this content. And then by the end of the session, I essentially had what looked like a whiteboard and in, can, could include references and then email this out to the students. This was okay, it's kind of clunky, it's not the best. And then I learned about this approach from social media. Um, so this is the idea of using your phone and a box as an overhead projector. So what is old is clearly new again. You could cut a hole in the top of the box. You can join any conference with first your computer, but then also join with your phone and just don't join by audio. And then you can ask your students to spotlight this video or to pin this video so that essentially what they're seeing is just that piece of paper and you can use that as your whiteboard. Now, over time, um, we've learned about more advanced methods. We are a Zoom institution, um, so we this is what my screen looks like when I'm using a uh, whiteboard on that platform. Most video conference platforms have some sort of whiteboard technology. But then you could also use a tablet. And um, if you're drawing or writing, that's often a little less clunky than using a mouse. Now, there are a lot of folks that have published at this point, and I've given you two references here on how to teach, especially in small groups, on these video conference platforms. And some colleagues and I put this infographic together about what you might think about before, during, and after the session. So before you want to invest in learning the platform, um, this is actually my first time giving a talk on WebEx. So I spent some time this week going through tutorials in case there was a, a big tech failure. We also encourage that you use the buddy system. You can use a buddy in a number of ways. It could be for tech support. So Clint is my buddy today um, if I'm having tech problems, but you could also have a buddy that co-teaches with you, someone that moderates the chat box or helps create breakout rooms. And then we encourage folks to prepare and practice. I find that everything takes a little bit longer when I'm teaching online. And then during the session, you want to minimize interruptions turning everything off on your screen, putting a sign on your door. If you are one of those people that has 14,000 unread email messages, please turn off those notifications. People like me get really anxious when they see full inboxes like that. And then we're gonna chat a little bit more about connecting with learners and uh, making it interactive. So I'll come back to, to those two. And then at the end, you wanna get feedback. You wanna get feedback from your learners. You also wanna get feedback from peers. We have a really robust coaching system at the University of Washington. So every time I give a small talk, a small group talk, one of my colleagues is sitting in the audience completing a structured assessment tool and we meet after that teaching session um, for feedback. And then I think it's helpful after these sessions to also provide some sort of a follow-up. I gave you an example of um, sending out a PDF of that one slide to the students, but you could also email out additional materials. You could send out a summary. We'll talk through some more examples of follow-up that you can provide. And while I think video conference technology is it's not the same as in person, I do think there are ways to make things interactive online. Um, there are lots of ways that you can ask questions. We have found the chat box to be the great equalizer. There are folks who never would have felt comfortable raising their hand or saying something in a small group that feel empowered to do so in the chat box, which is great. You can use polling either within the platforms or using a program like Poll Everywhere. For those of you that like to have think, pair, share activities in your small groups, the virtual equivalent of that is a breakout room. The idea of putting people in smaller groups in a room together and having them play with a concept or work through a problem. And then you can annotate whiteboards and have students do that as well, or use shared documents. So sometimes we'll use something like Google Doc and have people in breakout rooms actually generate ideas and put those on a form. And when we come back to the larger, larger group, we can all review those together. And that might be a document that you send out to people after the session. The other big change that we saw in terms of formats, and uh, I knew many folks mentioned this, is the format of interviews. In May, the Coalition for Physician Accountability, which is an umbrella organization uh, comprised of about 12 different groups, including the ACGME and the National Residency Matching Program, 
came out with recommendations discouraging away rotations for trainees and recommending virtual interviews for everyone. And they also delayed the electronic residency application service opening date to August 12th. Um, so this was a big event for training programs. And I think um, now that this is all in the rear view mirror after our first year in retrospect, I think this was a really, really good thing. So my hope is that we actually keep virtual interviews moving forward. I think there are a lot of costs that are saved with virtual interviews. There is a huge financial cost. Um, there's a cost to programs, but a much bigger cost to applicants with the average cost being about $6,000 for an applicant. Although for folks that are applying to competitive specialties or to a very large number of programs, that could be tens of thousands of dollars. There's an opportunity cost. So when trainees are traveling all around the country for three weeks, that is time away from clinical rotations. It's time away from family and friends. And I think there's some other challenges that come with this travel. One of our GI fellows actually wrote a piece talking about her experience traveling to seven programs in 11 days when she was eight months pregnant. Um, and as someone who became a mom after my training, that was something I hadn't actually stopped to consider how challenging that would be. There's also a diversity cost. Um, if it's costing six, eight, ten thousand dollars to travel around the country, there are gonna be folks who are gonna find that cost to be prohibitive. And I think that's a loss to our programs that we don't get to meet those individuals. And then finally, there is a environmental cost um, of folks traveling all around the country during this time. Now, fortunately, a lot of groups have come together to provide some recommendations about how we implement virtual interviews. I've given you uh, several references here. I'm gonna talk about the one in academic medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, they formed a multidisciplinary task force with trainees and program leaders. And they were charged with reviewing the evidence base for virtual interviews and coming up with some best practices. So these were their recommendations. They said programs should be coming up with a very detailed process for these interviews, that they should all be using standardized interview questions to minimize bias, and that they should recognize that there will still be bias um, and to figure out how to both recognize and respond to bias when it occurs. They talked about preparing current trainees for this new format and then really investing time and even money in developing electronic materials, high quality materials for applicants to review. And then finally, they said, we need to study this. We need to collect some data, see how it's going and then iteratively improve for next year. Okay, we've been uh, disseminating educational content, I think in new ways uh, for the last five or 10 years, but we saw some more advancement this year. I think one big way was breaking down barriers with virtual conferences. This is Jerry Sifogia. He's one of our former pulmonary and critical care fellows, who's now an assistant professor at Tulane University. And he was able to visit us last summer virtually to talk to us about healthcare disparities in COVID-19. And he spoke about his experience in New Orleans, taking care of patients, with very different demographics than in Seattle. And there's no way he would have been able to do this um, with travel restrictions without virtual conferences. And I think that was definitely to our benefit. I'm also another example of that. Um, I am thrilled to be with you all today. I am also highly intolerant of cold weather, anything below 45 degrees. So it would have been really challenging for me to travel to Wisconsin in February. So I'm glad that we have these virtual conferences and I think it really opens doors for people. I think the other advantage is that many of these conferences are now recorded. Uh, personally, I don't have enough time in the day to watch all of the presentations that I would like to. Um, these have become incredibly accessible, which is wonderful. Um, but it's almost to the point that it's overwhelming. It's, it's hard to keep up with all of the learning that's available to us. We've also seen further growth in podcasts. Um, I think learners have always loved these. They're accessible, they're entertaining, they're educational, and people can access these in their own time. They're asynchronous. So I know lots of folks that listen to podcasts on their commute to work. I've highlighted um, 
clinical problem solvers here. This is one of the popular podcasts in internal medicine, and they recently put together a series on anti-racism in medicine. And I've also shared uh, a reference here from a perspective in the Journal of Graduate Medical Education, where they actually recommend that we start thinking about incorporating podcasts into curricula. That maybe this is a way to share perspectives that may not be available to our learners at their home institutions, and that there are ways to vet this content um, and allow learners to experience them. Now, social media has been driving a lot of education in the last uh, decade. I've listed here um, some folks who provide a lot of education on Twitter. Um, they represent general internal medicine, pulmonary and critical care medicine, hepatology, and um, this is just a handful of folks. Um, many of them provide tutorials, these threads that provide education. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about Nick Mark. He is also one of our former fellows in pulmonary and critical care, and he practices as an intensivist now in Seattle. He's highly active on social media. And he's also, in addition to educating through Twitter, he has also in this past year created these ICU one pagers. And I've given you the website there that is freely accessible to anyone. These are basically one page summaries of common things in critical care that are lovely. I'm going to highlight a few things here. He color codes them. So you'll notice on this uh, one pager about non invasive positive pressure ventilation, everything that has to do with ventilation is in green and oxygenation is blue. So when you come down here and you're trying to figure out what you're going to adjust on the ventilator, depending on if the problem is with ventilation or oxygenation, you can refer to those colors. He also inserts hyperlinks. So here I can see, okay, this is useful in COPD to avert intubation and reduce mortality. I can click on that link and go to that uh, primary literature to learn more. And then finally, he crowdsources. So he has 15,000 or some obscene number of followers on Twitter, and they give him feedback on these. And you'll notice at the top right-hand corner, you can link to the most current version. So I'd encourage you to go to this website and check these out. This is just another example on thromboelastography. I use these all the time when I'm teaching with clinical teams. And then I think the remarkable thing is the number of downloads he gets in a month. He tells me he averages 30,000 downloads a month and his original one pager was on COVID-19 and that was downloaded 150,000 times. So just imagine having that kind of a reach with your educational content. All right, finally, I just want to acknowledge um, some outstanding colleagues, Varen Kahl and colleagues, as well as Nina Jane and uh, Graham Carlos, who independently published two reviews of medical education and COVID-19. And they're both outstanding. They highlight different aspects, I think, of both the pandemic and changes in medical education. So I think if you're interested in this topic, I would encourage you to check these out. Okay, so that's what we've accomplished so far. What is in the future for us? So I'm gonna share three things that I'm thinking more about um, as an educator, and this could obviously be a very long list. I think the first thing is the lessons from the pandemic. One of the big advantages, as challenging as it was, we really got to think big. I think traditionally in medical education, we've taken the same way we've always done something and then we've made these small tweaks or adjustments and it's constrained us from really thinking about incorporating new content or trying new ways of doing things. And with the pandemic, we didn't have a choice. We had to just start, off, start from scratch um, and think big. And I hope we take that with us moving forward. The other thing we had to do was be nimble and act fast. So the folks at Vanderbilt actually spoke about their normal process for creating a course for their medical students is months long, right? They would vet the content and the speakers and they would create something for about 20 students and they would pilot test it and get feedback and make some small adjustments. And when they created their pandemic medicine course, they didn't have that luxury. They had to create brand new content on public health now for 200 plus medical students, and they had to do it in less than two weeks. So that was certainly a challenge, but 
um, it's pretty incredible to see how quickly we can do things um, when it's necessary. So I think those are great lessons to take moving forward. I think the second is thinking more about race and racism in medical education. I have an image here of a spirometer. Um, for the last decade or so, I've been teaching in the pulmonary pathophysiology course for the first year medical students. And one of the talks I give is on pulmonary function testing. And about three or four years ago, I gave this talk and I had a medical student come up to me afterwards to say, why didn't you talk about the history of the spirometer? And I was, I'm ashamed to say, I didn't know the history of the spirometer. I had gotten a high quality medical education, outstanding training and residency and pulmonary and critical care medicine fellowship. Um, and what I didn't know is that soon after the spirometer was brought to the United States from England, it was used by a plantation owner to demonstrate critical deficiencies in the lung function of his slaves that he said made them ill-suited for liberty. Many of you know that we still use a race correction in uh, interpreting pulmonary function tests. And that conversation made me reflect a bit on my role as a teacher. I think up until that point, I had spent so much time thinking about the delivery, about how do I make this interactive and engaging and spending time on you know, making my slides, but I hadn't invested as much time into what am I teaching about as an educator? Last spring, these five brilliant medical students, um, at the time they were all second year medical students and many of them are at the University of Washington. They wrote a perspective in academic medicine, um, providing recommendations to educators about how we should talk about race and racism in medicine. And they gave some great suggestions. They said, we need to talk about the impact of race and racism on health outcomes. They said, we need to take an interdisciplinary approach to this because it may be that some of our teachers um, like me never learn this stuff and that we should create space to have conversations about this in class. I will say these students were instrumental in um, changing our approach as an institution at UW Medicine um, to how we consider race in clinical medicine. We no longer use um, GFR. It is no longer reported in our, in our um, electronic medical record, and instead we use the CKD epi equation. I think these students played a big part in that change. Now, this is um, another medical student, now a second year medical student at Harvard Medical School. This is LaShira Nolan, and I have learned a lot from her. And she also spoke about her experience as a medical student and um, how she perceived the discussions around race and racism. So I'm gonna let her speak for herself. I have been warned that WebEx makes this video a little herky-jerky, but I'm told that you should be able to hear it. In my first year of medical school, as we were learning medicine, I realized that the representation of people who look like me, people who really uplifted me, I said earlier that I wouldn't be here if it weren't for my community. They weren't being represented represented in the, in the educational material that we were being taught. So number one, when we were learning how to do CPR, all of the bodies were white male bodies. When we were learning anatomy, all of the skin was represented as white in the language textbook that we were using. And then when we were in class learning about the Pyrrhite, the Relia Burgdorferi that causes Lyme disease, and we learned about stage one and how you can get this rash called erythema migrans. Um, a classmate of mine raised his hand and said, hey, how would I recognize this rash as someone who had skin like mine? And he was a black man and the professor really failed to give him an adequate answer and said, hey, you know, it might look more purple, but it, it, it's difficult to, to notice at times. And that was the end of the conversation. And then upon doing further research, I tweeted about it. People were really fired up and they also agreed. I realized that there weren't a lot of representation of the rash here in the migrants on black skin, on social media, on, on Google, or really in our educational material. And that's what really prompted me to write this piece because after I did more research, I learned that Black folks are, are more likely to present with later stage Lyme disease. And part of that is because we're not taught to recognize this key stage one that can happen in about 40% of patients. So I think that that was just reflective of the way that we were being presented statistics and how we never get context about why Black folks and numerous people have disproportionate amounts of diabetes, hypertension, or chronic diseases which are often a manifestation of racism. And I think that that's how we're missing the bullseye. We're not giving folks 
the context that they need to understand these statistics. Neither are we giving the, the representation that folks need so that they can go out and serve that third patient population. Okay, I hope you were able to hear that. Um, she's an incredible young woman, and I think um, we should really be listening to our students. Um, I've listed another reference, this bottom reference that I've listed from the New England Journal of Medicine, um, which also came out last year, provides a beautiful summary of where race correction is used in clinical medicine. And they have a table where they actually break it down by specialty. So if you're an oncologist or an endocrinologist or a pulmonologist, you can see where this comes up in our specialty. And I would encourage everybody to read that article um, to familiarize yourself with, with this history and to think about how we talk about this in the classroom. And then the final thing that I'm thinking about is how we make and maintain connections. I think one of the, the biggest challenges for me for, for everything being virtual is how do we connect with our learners? How do we connect with our colleagues? Um, I will say the educator community at the University of Washington has been a huge source of support for me in this past year. And I suspect that this is what you're going to be doing today during your education day is um, really making connections and learning from one another. So I just encourage us all to, to always be thinking about how we do that when we are physically distanced and when we are isolated. Okay, before I sum up, I've shared with you um, some of the things I'm thinking about as an educator moving forward, but I would love to know what your intentions are um, and what your wishes are. And I'm gonna invite you to tell me in the chat box. I recognize that this might be something um, personal. So if you want to just send it to me as a private chat, that would be fine and I won't read any names. A lot of kudos for you, Vishak in the chat box that's coming through. So I will say one of my intentions as an educator is to enhance the dissemination of the work that we do. Um, I think you've highlighted different ways of which people are disseminating some of the innovations, whether it's podcast or tweets, et cetera. And I think um, for me is expanding our outreach um, in ensuring that the impact of the things that we do are shared around the country or the world. And the world, yeah. yeah. So the things that I have seen so far um, are... Yes, so how do you peer review, what's your role of um, validating uh, online content uh, for use. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, great. Um, so I think this is, this is one of the challenges, right, of quickly disseminating information is that we could teach the wrong stuff. Um, so I think, you know, it is important to get all of that content vetted. I do think in a lot of ways, social media is peer review, right? You are gonna get a lot of feedback. If you are posting something that is incorrect or controversial, you're gonna get feedback on that. And I think one of the advantages of social media is that it is a conversation. I think unlike publications where they go out and that is a freestanding resource that, that millions of people are gonna consume. I think that the type of education we're working with in social media is much more about the conversation, which I think is equally valuable. Yeah. And I see that um, in terms of intentions, people are talking about um, kindness and empathy as part of education. Um, so, so important. I think one of the things I have realized this year is how much people have going on in their lives. Um, that I am always taken aback when I ask people, hey, how's it going? And then I find out that they lost a parent to COVID or they're going through a divorce or their spouse just lost their job. Um, and I think just being mindful of that all of the time. Um, people talked about committing to uh, exploiting the opportunities to blow up the status quo. I love that. Um, connections, um, thinking about valuing educators. Um, this is great. Empowering our learners to feel comfortable asking questions. Yes. Um, 
highlighting, I think all the time, like we are all learning, right? I learn something every day, um, whether it's working in the ICU or um, in a classroom. And I see people talking about podcasts more as a teaching tool. These, these are fantastic. So let me um, sum up with some of my take homes. Um, and then I would love to engage in, in conversation with folks and answer questions. So I hope I've shown you that while this has been such a challenging year on so many fronts, I think we have a lot to celebrate in medical education. I think there has been a ton of innovation and I am honestly floored. I look at my colleagues and um, they have all been doing extra clinical work, so much extra clinical work, yet they have made the time to say, no, this is important that we also um, continue to innovate and to share our practices. We talked about new content, new roles, new formats, both in terms of virtual conferences as well as interviews um, and new ways of disseminating information. And the things that I'm going to be thinking about moving forward really is this concept of blowing things up and um, thinking big and acting fast. Um, I'm thinking more, like I said, about um, the content of what I'm teaching, curating that content. And I gave you an example of race and racism in medicine, but, but there's other areas as well. Um, and then how we remain connected with our learners when we are so distanced. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my slides. I realize that I can't actually see you all, which makes me sad, um, but I would be happy to take any questions. Great, well, there's, thank you for an awesome uh, presentation. And there's a great term in Yiddish called uh, quelling like to swell with pride. And yeah. so I'm sitting there hearing you and I'm like, I am felling. Uh, also, uh, uh, it was a little bit of a history for me of all my former residents and students and fellows who are now actually leaders in education. So it, uh, it really is wonderful to see. A couple of um, comments in the Q&A talking about, you know, uh, being able to overcome technical challenges that we we previously thought were uh, a, a barrier um, and engaging in learners virtually, uh, in teaching on educating from development to delivery um, and, and not just an interactive education experience, but um, true engagement. Um, and then being able to uh, use a, a hybrid method and, and may be able to approach, you know, uh, interact with our students who have different learning styles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll start with that first part. I think the um, technology was a huge fear, right? We have, uh, I'll tell you right now, we just started teaching the pulmonary physiology block for the first year medical students and our faculty and fellows teach in that course. And this year we are doing it all on Zoom. Um, and there is, I will tell you, there's a lot of fear on behalf of all of the small group leaders of what do we do when there is a catastrophe? So. I actually think overall teaching online has gone mostly very smoothly. We've obviously all experienced the, the folks who are not muting themselves or who have dual monitors and just can't get their screen right. But I think a lot of that is just the preparation and practice. One of the things that um, that I found is a lot of these video conference platforms keep putting out updates very often, like once a week or once a month. And if you aren't installing those updates, that's when where the tech fails happen. So I think as long as you're investing in a little bit of preparation up front, trying out the technology um, before we taught the medical students, our small group leaders went in the rooms to try to figure out how do we create breakout rooms? How do we name these rooms and, and work with folks in academic learning technology to do that? Great. Okay. Um, we're open for questions. Um, one thing that you mentioned was you know, the benefits of a virtual interview process for residents and interviews and um, which I, fully agree with. Um, and the question is, what do you see um, the uh, um, future um, for that uh, once we are back to our new normal? Yeah, we don't know. So we just found out last week, I think, that at least at the University of Washington, we will stay with virtual interviews next year. Um, I will say there was so much fear about this, right? Um, there was a concern about with the barrier of travel going down, our program's gonna see huge numbers of applications. And some programs did. So some, our program, as an example, actually had the same number of applications that normally does in a given year. But we had some peer programs that said they saw 
percent increase in their number of applications. And that's obviously been a trend for the, the last several years now. So that was one part of the fear. I think the other part that was shared by both programs and applicants was this idea of how will I figure out a program's culture? How do I get a sense of how fellows and faculty interact with one another without being able to visit in person? Um, and I think that's surmountable as well. I, I mean, I, I truly think the onus is on programs. We need to figure out how to highlight that and we need to figure out how to show applicants that. One of, our, one of the things we did this year is that during our two month interview time, we actually invited applicants. We gave them the Zoom links to our weekly conferences. And we said, anytime in the next eight weeks, join anytime, listen in on our conferences, see how our case conference in pulmonary and critical care medicine um, works. So I think there's benefits that, you know, in a normal in-person interview, they would have never been able to have those opportunities. So I think we just have to get creative. I think like, like, so many other things, we just get constrained by, well, this is the way we've always done it, so this must be the right way to do it, and that's often not the case. Um, and how do you engage um, with learners who have different learning styles in a virtual format? So, um, great question, and I might twist that question a little bit. Um, so, we talk about learning styles a lot in terms of someone's an auditory learner versus a visual learner, and I think what we've seen in the literature is that some of that has actually been debunked, this idea that people have preferences for sure, um, but is there any evidence that teaching the auditory person a particular way is more effective than another way? I don't think we have that evidence. Um, I do think there's a lot of different ways on video conference platforms to, to engage people. So I'll use the pulmonary physiology course as an example, right? Some people are figure people, some people are equation people, and some people are drawing people. Um, and you can do all of those things. And in fact, it's, you know, if you're annotating something, I can type in an equation, I can cut and paste a figure um, from one of my slides, and then I can also um, draw something for the students, right? So I think you can leverage different parts of video conference platforms. I think the other thing that you can do is prime your learners. You may find that often in small groups, there are folks that are talking a little bit more, and then there's the quieter folks who don't want to engage, right? And I think one of the fears is they're not going to want to talk, especially on onto a computer screen. But there's ways to do that, right? You go into, you put some students in breakout rooms, and you find that that quiet student actually knows exactly how to answer this question. And you can prime them and say, wow, you're doing a great job. When we go back to a large room, would you be willing to teach us all about this, right? And so, they, one, they have advance warning. You're not cold calling on them, um, and two, you're you're letting them shine. You you just praise them and said you're doing an awesome job, and I want you to teach other folks too. So I think there are ways that you can draw out different types of learners, both with strategies for how you teach the content and how you have them interact. Great uh, question from Lauren Banachek. Do you think virtual learning will facilitate collaborations across institutions and how do we um, help facilitate those? Yeah, that's something we're thinking about um, a lot. I will say when our you know, annual meetings, our American Thoracic Society annual meeting um, got canceled last year and went to partially virtual, that was something we thought a lot for our trainees because that's where fellows really start networking and people meeting people at other institutions and we thought oh my gosh how are we gonna you know foster these types of connections but i think what we've pleasantly found is that it is possible to do that virtually i think the this concept of having people virtually visit your institution to give a talk and to spend some time with trainees um, has really opened up a lot of doors we've seen our our fellows participating in things like that so i think we have to be a little intentional about how we make those connections but I actually think it's taken away some of the barriers. And then from uh, Joe Bluestein, uh, do you think we're going to go, we're, are we going to slide back to our older teaching methods or which of our teaching methods do you think we'll go back to um, when we're back in person? Great. I think as human, human beings, our nature is to always slide back. So I think we have to try not to do that. Um, honestly, where, where we saw that, um, in action was when we did go to online teaching, it was really easy for people to go back and say, I'm just going to show 100 PowerPoint slides and just talk at the audience, right? 
Um, we've already seen that happen. And I think what we've been working towards, we work with the folks that teach our fellows to say, nope, this is going to be case-based. This is going to be interactive and we'll work with you on ways to engage the audience. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest risk, honestly, is um, losing the interactive piece. Great. All right. Um, and I'm going to hand it over, uh, baton virtually to Zach um, for the, the, you're on Zach. Vishak, that was absolutely exceptional. Um, thank you so much for coming out here. Um, My pleasure. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, I think that everybody, everybody here is a, a committed educator and what your talk has done, I think, is all, often we all sort of bemoan the fact that we're educating virtually and, you know, there's a sense of dread about having given didactic to a group of learners who you think they expect more, but really what your talk has done, I hope, at least for me, is just to offer us some sort of inspiration. This is actually a great thing, I think, as for a lot of ways that you've said, um, and I think that my sense is that this is here to stay. Um, and while it's, you've shown us how it's obviously much, you can be creative about delivering content, but what you've also given me, I think, and everyone else a chance to think about is how to engage the learners, because that face-to-face -face interaction in a classroom or a lecture hall um, will be missing, but I think that you've, you've shown me anyway is that there actually can be solutions to that, and I thank you for this. Absolutely superb. Thank you. My pleasure. Like I said, it's, it's my honor to visit you all, and I hope you have a wonderful education day. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Laura. Thank you so much. I echo what Lynn and Zach said, and I think you've offered us some very nice take home points, some great uh, review of the literature in some areas we can look and grow, and we appreciate this very much. Uh, this was a great launch to our education day. I want to let everybody know that uh, we'll start at 915 with our innovation grant presentations and check your email yesterday afternoon for those Zoom links if need be. But thank you very much, everybody, for your comments, and we appreciate your uh, your presentation today, Pasak. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Say hi to everybody. Will do. Will do. Take care. So safe travels back. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'll be back shortly. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, Bye. Thank you, Vishak.